Hello and welcome to Socialism, the Marxist podcast from the Socialist Party. What roles did Leon Trotsky play during the Russian Revolution? The events of 1917 and the years which immediately followed were a political furnace. Failed parties and leaders melted away as hardened political forces and inspirational leaders were forged in the white heat of revolution. There were huge leaps forward and crushing setbacks. Through it all, Leon Trotsky was one of the political figures most responsible for helping the workers' movement to navigate a way forward. This episode of Socialism looks at 1917 and the young workers' state. Trotsky during the revolution. So in the second in our series on Trotsky and Trotskyism, following our general introduction to some of the most important ideas and events during the life of Leon Trotsky, we're going to be honing in a little bit on his specific role during the Russian Revolution of 1917 and the years immediately afterwards. So we've got with us today Judy Beeson. Hello, Judy. Hello, James. Now, your chapter of the book is on that subject, Trotsky's role in the revolution, but also the Red Army and the Civil War and the Young Workers' State. That sounds like a lot to cover in one chapter because Trotsky played a leading role in events throughout that period, didn't he? Yes, he certainly did. (laughs) And alongside Lenin, he was an absolutely key leader throughout that period. Neither of them, in fact, Lenin or Trotsky, were actually in Russia when the first revolution broke out in 1917. That, of course, was the February 1917 revolution because they'd both been forced out of the country due to the repression of the Tsarist regime. They were both in exile. And Trotsky, in fact, was in New York when that February revolution took place. But, of course, was very eager to get back to Petrograd once the revolution took place. And unfortunately for him, he began the journey back to Russia but was arrested in Canada on the way and had to spend an entire month in detention in Canada. So, in fact, he arrived in Petrograd a month later than Lenin did. Now, of course, it was possible for them both to return and other Bolsheviks who were in exile and other revolutionary leaders because the February Revolution, which had been a mass outburst of discontent without actually being led by any of the political parties, in fact. That revolution had removed that brutal, autocratic, czarist regime and a temporary provisional government was in place after it. But in reality, as Lenin and Trotsky explained, it was in reality a situation of dual power because the provisional government was really holding power alongside the Soviets that had been formed at the end of the February Revolution. And really, that seven-month period between February and October, the two revolutions of that year, were about who would win out, the provisional government, which was a capitalist government, or the Soviets, which were nominally representatives of the workers and soldiers. And really, Trotsky and Lenin, both of them, were in the forefront during that period of orientating the Bolshevik party towards the task of winning a majority in the Soviets, as it was two other parties, the Mensheviks and the Social Revolutionaries, who, at least initially in that period, were in the leadership of them. And the other thing that they did was convince the other Bolshevik leaders and the rank and file of the Bolshevik party and the working class in the main cities that it was possible for the working class in Russia to actually move on, to sweep away that provisional government and to take power itself. So Trotsky was playing that role alongside Lenin. Now, we often talk about Trotsky as a Bolshevik leader, but actually at the time that he arrived back in Russia in 1917, he wasn't yet a Bolshevik party member. He did, however, already have some authority in the Russian (laughs) workers' movement at that stage, isn't that right? Yes, crucially, actually, 12 years before 1917, in the 1905 Russian Revolution, Trotsky had actually been elected as chairman of the Petrograd Soviet. And that Soviet was 
actually thrown up in the course of the revolution. Soviet basically means council. And it was really a council of workers' deputies, of strike leaders, actually, that came out of what was a very sweeping strike movement in 1905. And what's important to note is that that was a very different situation compared with the Soviets that were formed in February 1917, because, as I said, it was strike leaders that were to the fore in the Soviet leadership in 1905. But in 1917... The Soviets, they emerged after the events, after the revolution, in fact, not during the heat of it. So as a result of that, they had a different class composition to their forerunners in 1905. And with the background of the First World War conditions, they were mostly led in 1917, after that February revolution, by representatives of the peasantry and middle class professionals, lawyers, journalists and so on, rather than being worker activists. So this was the type of Soviet that was existing when they got back to Russia after that revolution. Now the other point that you just made in that question was that Trotsky wasn't formally in the Bolsheviks at that point in time and that's absolutely true. He didn't come formally into the Bolshevik party until August 1917, in fact. And if you go back to the split in the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party, the SDLP, in 1903, when it split into Bolsheviks and Mensheviks, for most of that time, since 1903, Trotsky had been in neither. He'd been in an organisation called the Mezryansi, which means sort of inter-district group, because it was trying to straddle the gap, really. Trotsky had hoped for a bringing back together of the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks. But when he got back to Russia in 1917, although he was still outside the Bolshevik party at that point in time, he had independently drawn the same conclusions as Lenin on the situation in Russia and the way forward for the revolution. And it is true to say that he was the only other revolutionary leader who had drawn the same conclusions as Lenin. And in fact, we can go a bit further than that and say that in some ways Trotsky had gone ahead of Lenin, in fact, because as far back as 1905, Trotsky had formulated his theory of permanent revolution, or you could translate it as uninterrupted revolution. That sometimes gives a more accurate idea of what he meant. And that theory predicted that the working class would need to play the decisive role in leading the revolution and that it wouldn't stop at the capitalist democratic tasks but would move on to socialist measures. Now I'm not going to say more about that here because, and I don't in the chapter of the book that we're talking about today, because there's a separate chapter in the book on the theory of permanent revolution. But that was Trotsky's position when he came back to Russia. It was Lenin's position completely. And in fact, the day after Trotsky got back to Petrograd, he made a speech urging that there should be no trust in the capitalists, that workers should control their own leaders, and also urged the working class to have confidence in its own revolutionary forces. That was the message he was putting across. And... Just, you know, one last point, because he came back a month after Lenin, Lenin had already during that month reorientated to the Bolshevik party along those political lines. You know, Trotsky didn't have to directly take part in that because that was a job that Lenin had already done, in fact. So after this period came the setback of July, when the Bolshevik leaders actually had to attempt to hold back the revolution. Is that right? Yes, yeah. I mean, before July, the Bolsheviks started growing quite rapidly in that period after Lenin and Trotsky got back and, as I was just saying, had reorientated the Bolshevik party with a clear programme, a clear political programme on the way forwards that appealed to the working class, the peasantry and, of course, the soldiers at the front who were still fighting in the war, which was, you know, a completely hated war, very much so at that time. But, yeah, come July, there was a semi-insurrection, there was an outbreak of mass desperation really I think you could call it a desperation for change a desperation for the end of the war and for a different situation for improvements in living standards you know for an end to the mass poverty and war conditions basically the Bolshevik leaders though they saw it as premature because they didn't yet have a majority in the Soviets they needed to build 
greater support in order to be able to not just take power but hold on to it. That was one key issue that they were looking at. Take power, hold it and then consolidate it. Whether they had enough support on an all-Russia basis for that at that point was an issue that they were discussing. But also the workers' movement in Petrograd was ahead of the rest of the country, so they saw it as necessary to have a catching up in other cities across Russia at that time. So they wanted to really hold back that movement at that point in time, and the Bolshevik leaders, including Lenin, were making speeches to the mass demonstrations basically saying that that wasn't the moment, you know, to actually go for power at that point. And Trotsky was doing exactly the same. You know, Trotsky, I should say, was a very skilled orator. He quickly became extremely useful to the Bolshevik party as one of their most effective speakers, even before he was formerly a member of the party. And he was also a very skilled writer. He was helping to write the Bolsheviks' documents before he was an actual member as well. So, again, politically... You know, he was completely with Lenin and the other Bolshevik leaders at that point, and as he was right through 1917. And he basically was also saying that the uprising, the working class in Petrograd, needed to hold back at that point in time from pushing for power. Then after that, you know, the Bolsheviks succeeded in having a drawing back of that movement, but that then led to a period of very heavy repression against the entire workers' movement, with the Bolsheviks being slandered, arrested, they were being beaten in the streets, some Bolsheviks were even killed in the streets, their newspaper Pravda was, the premises was trashed, Lenin had to go into hiding, he was being accused of being a German spy, and not long after that, Trotsky as well was forced out of the picture on the ground because he was arrested and thrown into the Cresty prison and actually spent a month there during the course of that Titanic year. So those were clearly very difficult days. But Trotsky, you know, is obviously the subject of this book. Like all great Marxists, was not pessimistic at any point in time even when he was those very difficult days where the movement was pushed backwards for some weeks. He was very confident about what was to come after those difficult days. Um, In fact, if you read his autobiography, My Life, he says in that that just before his arrest, when Lenin was already in hiding and, you know, there was already, you know, a mass slanderous campaign against the Bolsheviks on the part of the authorities. He actually said to that meeting that after that crisis, then they could expect to have a rapid upswing of the movement and that the mass of people would become, and to use his words, he said they would become twice as strongly attached to the Bolsheviks when they had verified themselves the truth of what they were saying, the truth of the facts that they were saying. So, you know, he always maintained that optimism and he always played a role in lifting up the movement and the mood. And and by the way, it was during that month he spent in prison that the Fifth Congress of the Bolshevik Party took place, which voted for the merger into their ranks of Trotsky's group, the Mesoyante. So that's when he actually became an official member when he was in prison. And... Several of his group, in fact, including Trotsky himself, were elected straight onto the Bolshevik Central Committee at that Congress. So, (laughs) ups and downs. The February Revolution allows revolutionary leaders to come back in. Then there's a major setback, a period of reaction. Trotsky and many other Bolsheviks are languishing in prison. We know that's not the end of the story. How do they get out? How do they get out of prison, return from exile or hiding in other cases, and go back on the offensive? Well, the key reason for the timing of those events was that the provisional government began to face a major crisis and that was in the form of a coup attempt that was being organised by an army commander, General Kornilov, and neither the provisional government nor the leaders of the Soviets, the social revolutionaries and the Mensheviks, were able to organise, basically mobilise the working class against that coup that, of course, was threatening both the Soviets and the provisional government. So they needed the Bolsheviks. They needed the Bolsheviks because of their links, their authority, basically, with the 
working class in Petrograd and beyond. And they needed their determination and organising skills as well. And so they were being let out of prison and were able to come back from hiding in some cases. In fact, you know, Lenin wasn't able at that point to come back. But Trotsky was let out of prison on the basis that, uh, in fact, he went straight from the prison, he says in his autobiography, to the newly organised, what he refers to as the Committee for the Defence of the Revolution. And by the revolution there, he's talking about the February Revolution that, of course, ousted Tsarism and brought in a interim regime. And it was a question of defending that regime, that interim regime, against the reactionary General Kornilov, who would have taken things back, you know, who would have brought back elements of Tsarism. But now... Six months after that February revolt, this provisional government was hanging by a thread because of this threat of the coup. And as I said, the Bolsheviks were the only ones really who had the necessary base in the working class to lead a struggle to defeat Kornilov. And what they decided, and Trotsky was instrumental in all of this, was to take on, that they said the movement had to take on Kornilov first, that they had to deal with that threat of reaction first, and then move on to deal with the provisional government after that. So what they did, they saw the first task as it being necessary to work in a united front with other left parties in order to most effectively defeat the reaction, to defeat Kornilov. And that's exactly what they did. But also, very importantly, while doing that, they were preparing the way for their second major task, even more major task, we could say, by moving on after that for the working class to take power. And the way they were preparing for that is that they safeguarded their own political independence in that united front. In other words, they safeguarded their own programme. They didn't compromise on programme with what were other left organisations that they had completely profound differences with, the SRs and the Mensheviks in particular, who were not going to agree to that task of the working class taking power. But they didn't compromise at all their programme with them, and that was absolutely essential. So the provisional government didn't have sufficient authority within the wider population, in particular among the workers and soldiers, to be able to lead a defence of itself against the Kornilov attempted coup. Mm, that's right. And as such, it was almost posed, well, it's the workers and the socialist movement against a kind of brutal, you might almost call it fascistic, attempt at dictatorship, that those were the options on the table, is that right? Yes, it was precisely that, yes. So that's why the Bolsheviks had to, you know, take the lead, basically, in defeating Kornilov, defeating that reaction. And then... After that, turn on what they referred to as the compromisers, Mm. the Mensheviks and the SRs, because it was the Mensheviks, and they call them compromisers, because basically they were compromising with capitalist interests. And at the end of the day, they were siding with capitalist interests because it wasn't possible to continue in some kind of middle road. The whole period between February and October showed that a middle road wasn't going to achieve anything. It wasn't solving any of the problems that the masses faced in Russia. It wasn't ending the war, it wasn't solving the problems of hunger, of want, of poverty, and the Bolsheviks, you know, understood well that what was needed was for the working class to take power, basically, and that's what the SRs and Mensheviks were not going to deliver. So the idea put forward by some capitalist commentators that the Russian Revolution was stolen away from a liberal capitalist democracy, which could have been isn't really true. It's nonsense. That was never on the cards. Absolutely not true, because there was no chance of that kind of capitalist democracy in Russia at that time. The level of production in Russia at that time was very low compared to the advanced capitalist countries in Europe. And the capitalist class was really struggling for even, you know, at that time. This is dealt with a bit more fully, I think, in the chapter on permanent revolution. But the capitalist class didn't have the base at that time in terms of the productive base to develop in the way that they would have liked to have done. So the tables had turned. The Bolsheviks now had the upper hand to move towards the working class taking power. Yes. After Trotsky's release from prison, which was in the beginning of September we're in now, the Petrograd Soviet elected a Bolshevik majority for the first time and Trotsky became its chairman, as, of course, you know, he had led it, as I said earlier, in 1905. I'm sorry, just about this Petrograd Soviet then, because... 
Earlier in 1917, you've made the point that following the February Revolution, that they didn't have a particularly working class composition. It was mainly middle class intellectuals. So had this changed by this point? Yes, it was changing throughout those months, basically. As the Bolsheviks were winning support for their programme, they were gaining more influence in the Soviets, you know, not just the Petrograd Soviets, but beyond that as well. I mean, in September, they also won a majority in the Moscow Soviet as well. They didn't have a majority in the leadership of those Soviets at that point, but they were gaining majorities in the body of those Soviets. And at each twist and turn during the course of events, they were showing more and more and more to the workers and the peasantry the superiority of their programme over the SRs and the Mensheviks, who were in the leadership, as I said, of the Soviets. And during September, there were twists and turns. There was an attempt by those bankrupt Soviet leaders, the Mensheviks and SRs, to hold what they called a democratic conference. I mean, this was all because the provisional government was failing so abysmally. They called this democratic conference to then lead to what they called a pre-parliament in order to try and create some kind of capitalist stability, really, and, you know, to counterpose that to what the Bolsheviks were going for, you know, workers, power workers in control of society. And Trotsky was one of those who intervened in those bodies, And in fact, he spoke in both the Democratic Conference and the pre-Parliament, and he led a walkout. It was Trotsky who led a walkout of the Bolsheviks from the pre-Parliament after reading out a statement in that pre-Parliament of the Bolsheviks' programme. And I think it's just worth mentioning some of the demands, some of their central demands that he raised when he spoke then. For the peasantry, their key demand was expropriation without compensation of the landed estates, which of course was a key demand as far as winning the peasantry went. For workers, they were calling for workers' control of production and distribution, and also of the banks, again, key demand that was very popular. They were calling for nationalisation of the most important industries at that stage. And very importantly for the whole population, the immediate ending of the war, the immediate offer of a democratic peace, as they put it, to all the peoples who were at war. And very importantly, they were also calling for the arming of the working class and the formation of Red Guards because of the threat of counter-revolution. And really, the whole mobilisation against Kornilov had enabled the Bolsheviks to insist that arms should be distributed to workers against the government's inclination. I mean, the government had been trying to disarm workers, but the threat of Kornilov meant that the Bolsheviks were able to raise this issue of the need to arm the working class. And of course, as far as the Bolsheviks were concerned, it wasn't just to deal with Kornilov, it was precisely to move on to deal with the compromisers after that. And all this was vital preparation for success in the October Revolution. And I should also say, not just for success in it, to win, but for it to be carried out with very little bloodshed as it was. Because, you know, if you have greater strength of arms on the part of the working class, then, you know, it made the balance of forces very decisive. And it meant that there was virtually no bloodshed in Petrograd in particular on the day that they actually went for power. So they had such support that they were in effect able to encircle the enemy and just force a defeat without firing a shot almost. Yes. Is that right? Yes. yes. So the stormy events of 1917 had demonstrated to more and more of the working class and the mass of the population in Russia that the capitalists and the socialists, so-called, who were compromising with them, couldn't find a way out of the crisis, couldn't satisfy the desperate needs of ordinary people in Russia. And as a result of that, more and more workers and soldiers have become involved in the struggle that by a certain point had elected more and more delegates to Soviets, that more and more Soviet delegates had been convinced of the Bolsheviks' programme, although it was very up and down. There were lots of twists and turns as you described so far in achieving that situation. And we finally arrive at the moment then of readiness to take power. So what role did Trotsky play in that? Well, an absolutely central role, I think, would be uh, no exaggeration whatsoever. The actual taking of power on the night of the 24th to 25th of October was carried out by many Bolshevik Party members, leaders, other workers. But it's no exaggeration at all to say that Trotsky played the foremost pivotal organising role in the 
decisions and actually, you know, organising the actions on the ground. He really planned and directed the organisation of the uprising. Don't forget, he was president of the Petrograd Soviet, but he also was president of a body which I haven't mentioned yet, which was called the Military Revolutionary Committee. And that had been set up by the Petrograd Soviet to supervise the defence of the city. Lenin was still in exile, he was in Finland, so he wasn't actually able to directly take part in the insurrection that took place in October. But he had been urging the Bolsheviks for weeks, in fact, to go ahead with it. You know, he'd been saying, the time is right, the time is right. You'll miss the opportunity if you delay any longer. Now, Trotsky was there in Petrograd and he came up with a plan fully agreed by the other Bolsheviks in the Bolshevik leadership. It wasn't just the plan of one man, but Trotsky was absolutely instrumental in terms of the tactics and strategy of what took place. And what he decided to do was to use the Military Revolutionary Committee's defensive remit, not just for the city of Petrograd, but also Trotsky's plan was to say that the Military Revolutionary Committee needed to defend the second All-Russia Congress of Soviets, which was due to convene. And that was due to convene on the 25th of October. So, you know, he raised the idea that it was necessary to defend that gathering from the threat of counter-revolution, from the threat of reaction. So he set about getting the armed workers and soldiers in Petrograd to, in the name really of defending that Congress, to go for giving power to that Congress, basically. In other words, to stop the situation of dual power between the provisional government and the Soviet, and to remove the impotent provisional government and hand power, full power, to the Soviet, which was, of course, don't forget, the Soviet was the representatives of workers, peasants and soldiers. That's what that body was. And for that to take the power with the Bolsheviks at the helm. And in the days before the taking of power, it was Trotsky who really organised the detailed practical measures that were necessary, including winning over workers and soldiers who weren't yet convinced of the need for the transformation or weren't convinced about how it could actually be done. And then, of course, once Trotsky had convinced them, he then set about making sure that they had the arms in order to make sure the whole goal was seen through. And he did get personally involved in making many trips to speak to groups of sailors, soldiers, workers in factories and actually convince them himself. And one of the very important trips he made was on the 23rd of October when he himself went to the Peter and Paul Fortress and he succeeded in switching the mood round <laughs> in that fortress to one of support for the coming battle, with the result that not only did he get support of the soldiers in that fortress, but he gained 100,000 rifles (laughs) that were inside the (laughs) fortress, which were then placed at the disposal of the Military Revolutionary Committee for the uprising. So, you know, that's just one example, but he was carrying out that kind of role, that direct role in those days before they actually took power. And then it was during the night of the 24th and 25th of October, that the workers of Petrograd, as I just mentioned earlier, what they did was they carried out the instructions of the Military Revolutionary Committee and took control of the main state institutions in the capital. And then it was Trotsky who, the following day, early in the morning, announced to the Petrograd Soviets, I declare that the provisional government no longer exists. That was it. You know, they'd swept it aside. And by the way, that same meeting welcomed Lenin back, who at last was able to reappear at that point. (laughs) So for the first time in the history of humankind, the majority in society had taken power out of the hands of a privileged minority. Yes, and the Mensheviks and the SRs wanted to hand it back (laughs) immediately. As I said, the Second Congress of the Soviets was about to start, and when it started, the first thing virtually that they did, the Menshevik leader Dan called desperately on the Bolsheviks a desperate appeal to form a coalition with the Mensheviks and the SRs. <laughs> and 
and, you know, you know, to try and stop the Bolsheviks from forming a government on behalf of the working class that they were representing. And Trotsky replied to Dan saying that the people had won a victory and were not going to give it up. That was his answer. And in fact, that Congress, that of course, you know, they didn't know in advance exactly what the composition of the Congress was going to be, but it did turn out to have a pro-Bolshevik majority of delegates. So that Congress was able to vote in a Bolshevik government which they proceeded to call the Council of People's Commissars, and the Bolsheviks made that accountable to the Soviets. And Lenin was made the chair of that council, that new government, and Trotsky was appointed the Commissar for Foreign Affairs at that time in order to turn to ending the war, to Russia's negotiations and ending its participation in the First World War. Now, you see, because... They were at the helm. You see the capitalist press and education system everywhere that, oh, this was some kind of dictatorship by Lenin and Trotsky, that they were as individuals running the new worker state at that time. But that is an invention, that argument, to denigrate the revolution because, in fact, I mean, as I've already said, the actual insurrection itself was carried out by tens of thousands of workers, in fact. You know, it was beyond even, you know, the thousands that were then in the Bolshevik Party that took part. But after the revolution, the bodies of the Bolshevik Party, the committees of the Soviets, all the workers' movement bodies were discussing freely, decisions were being taken democratically, and the Bolshevik leaders were keeping a dialogue going with the working class and the peasantry to make sure that they were acting in tune with people's needs and wants. You know, there was no acting kind of as individuals by Lenin and Trotsky. They were acting in a democratic way with the other leaders in the bodies that they were part of. But... It was deeds that mattered most, and it was deeds that they carried out. And it was the carrying out of their pledges that consolidated the victory. Because instead of the provisional government had just, you know, as I said, delivered nothing in its months in power, the Bolshevik government very quickly moved concretely to end participation in the war, to distribute land to the peasants' committees, to give workers control over production and another important demand was to grant the nations that made up what was the greater Russia area the right to self-determination, another very important demand. And what they did, those were immediate measures, but in the months and the years after the revolution, all the old laws were thrown out and new ones were enacted, including many measures to improve workers' terms and conditions, the nationalisation of the major industries... But also, very importantly, which I think you know most people know about, the granting of equal rights to women, equal pay, maternity leave, abortion rights, divorce rights, you know these were the vote. yes, all of these were enormous gains for Russian women workers at that time, and as I said, Trotsky was the Minister of Foreign Affairs, and he was the one who led the Soviet delegation to the Brest-Litovsk Peace Conference, which in March 1918 ended Russia's participation in the First World War. But unfortunately, that peace was short-lived, wasn't it? Because then came a devastating civil war in Russia and a new role for Trotsky. Yeah, he had to, unfortunately, move, or we could say fortunately, because, you know, again, he played an absolutely crucial role. He had to move from foreign affairs to becoming the commissar of war and the navy and that was at Lenin's request in fact because of the crucial nature that that job was because of the onset of the brutal civil war at that time against the new workers state. The white armies, the counter-revolutionary armies, white as they were referred to, were coming to take military force against the new state. They were representing all the various pro-capitalist interests, those of landowners, big business, the reactionary middle layers, the foreign imperialist powers, who also sent in armies. 21 foreign armies also invaded Russia in that civil war. And it was Trotsky that Lenin (laughs) saw as being the necessary person to build a Red Army from scratch, in fact, which is what Trotsky had to set about doing. In my life, his autobiography, Trotsky says, was I prepared to do military work? (laughs) Of course not, he says. But he says he had no experience of army work. He'd spent 
what would have been his army service years in prison, in exile. But, you know, he acknowledged that there wasn't anyone else who was able to actually play that role at that time as he could. So he built the Red Army. He built it to a force of over five million by the end of 1920. And he also played an absolutely upfront, involved role as a leader. I mean, there were, you know, obviously defeats as well as victories. It was a very turbulent period. And in fact, he spent two and a half years of it in a train, an adapted train at the various fronts, just travelling all over, going from front to front. A train that was carrying arms, specialist soldiers, activists, provisions, a printing press, a radio aerial that carried all sorts of vital equipment. And he was basically raising the morale at the fronts as well as intervening on the vital issues of strategy and tactics on how to win the concrete battles that were taking place. And other participants at the time commented in written material afterwards that Trotsky always kept a very optimistic approach in the most desperate of situations. And it did get incredibly desperate because, for instance, Petrograd itself nearly fell at one point in 1919. The Whites were within sight distance of Petrograd and it was Trotsky who urged a defence of the city, not for, not for the city to be just given up, handed over, evacuated, but for there to be a defence of the city. And then he, having won that argument, he then actually organised that defence. So there were many times where he had to play that kind of role during that civil war. And it was really, given the forces that were against them, it was an extraordinary accomplishment that the Bolsheviks managed to win that civil war. When you look at the problems that they faced, the legacy of the World War devastation, the blockades that the imperialist powers were imposing, mm. outbreaks of famine, outbreaks of disease. But it was clearly, you know, both Trotsky's brilliance in the way that he built the Red Army and instilled it with a fighting spirit, a revolutionary fighting spirit, and he approached that in a very political way. And it was that that inspired the huge sacrifices by the soldiers and sailors that led that army to victory. But there were also revolts taking place amongst the peasantry against the whites. And another important issue is that the Bolsheviks made appeals to the working classes of the intervening foreign powers. So that was also a very important factor in helping them to achieve victory against those intervening armies. And Trotsky was, of course, instrumental in all of that, really, instilling the will to press on and win. And while this isn't the most important point, there was no small amount of personal courage involved in that as well, wasn't there? Arriving, as you say, in Petrograd, but he was personally on the ground, arriving on horseback to organise that defence, and also at one point even taking part in a torpedo boat sortie against a white blockade. Of course, his main role was, as you say, a decision maker and an inspirer and an organiser. Mm. Oh yeah, he was nearly killed more than once in that war, and it was very courageous. He didn't mindlessly put his life at risk, mm. but he realised that he had to lead from the front and that sometimes he would be in situations where he was in danger, and he absolutely was. So it was a remarkable victory to defeat 21 invading armies of imperialism and the reactionary forces summoned from the defenders of the old order in Russia itself. But then what other roles did Trotsky play after the civil war? Well, by 1920, he was in a position to be able to play other roles because of they were having the upper hand by that stage in the civil war. And one of the roles that he played for you know, not a very long period, but it was a very significant job he did, was to improve the transport system <laughs> across the country, which was in a dreadful state. And again, it was Trotsky that, you know, was seen as somebody who could be a fixer and had gained experience, of course, on the logistical issues concerning transport during the Civil War itself. But perhaps the most important role that he came to play in those few early years of the worker state was in drafting the manifestos of, in fact, the first four congresses of the new Communist International he drafted the manifestos of, because he turned towards that international work because, he, alongside Lenin, he viewed it as essential that there would be a socialist revolution taking place in Europe, particularly in Germany, because the Soviet state needed material assistance that could be provided through workers coming to power, in a country that had a much higher level of technology and production. And they realised that 
socialism couldn't be built and endure in a country with the level of production that the Russia had, but also in one country with the limits of the boundaries of one country, that it would need to spread internationally. So from the time of the first World Congress of what was the third international, the Communist International, in 1919, until the start of its political generation, five years later, Trotsky did put a lot of time into that new international. And it's on those points that this chapter of the book really ends, although there are some points towards the end just on Trotsky's relations with Lenin, because, of course, you know, again, there's been so many distortions on that issue. And a lot of those distortions arose precisely at that time, in fact, at the time of the end of those early years of the period after the Russian Revolution, when Lenin died in 1924, and that was seized on by Stalin and Kamenev and Zinoviev with him, which they referred to as the Triumvirate. And they were trying to move the Bolshevik Party away from Lenin's political ideas. But precisely because Trotsky had been such a close co-thinker of Lenin and fundamentally had the same political positions as Lenin, of course they had differences, but they generally came to agreement on all the important questions. And because they had that closeness politically, then in order to move away from Leninism, it was necessary for Stalin and co. to sideline Trotsky as well. So they basically, you know, turned on Trotsky and, you know, what became known as Trotskyism, you know, it, it was basically made out to be an alien ideology to what had happened in Russia with the Russian Revolution, when, of course, you know, it's absolutely not the case at all. The relations between Trotsky and Lenin, as I said, they were up and down at times, but fundamentally, politically and personally, in fact, very close. One meeting, in fact, in the Civil War, this was in 1919, Lenin had even signed a blank piece of paper and handed it to Trotsky, authorising him to take any decisions that he might take. <laughs> you know, that's how much he trusted Trotsky's judgment. And as you can see from, you know, everything that we've said in this podcast, Lenin entrusted Trotsky with some of the most important stages, the most important stages, actually, of the events during the revolution itself, before the revolution, during the revolution, and during the civil war after it. But all of those events, obviously, we've only been able to deal with very briefly... <laughs> In this podcast, they're only dealt with briefly in the chapter. And I have to urge listeners to read the crucial material like Trotsky's My Life, his autobiography, and his History of the Russian Revolution, but also the material on the first five years of the Common International as well, to get a thorough understanding of what actually took place. So Trotskyism originated as a kind of slur by the Stalinists, for what, in effect, and this is the important point, was the legitimate continuation of the politics of Lenin and Bolshevism. But that's really what Trotskyism represented for them, but they were trying to move away from that. There's just one final question I'd like to ask you, Judy, if that's OK. And it's that, given that Trotsky was obviously an extraordinary individual who had enormous influence on events, who you might describe as a genius in his political theories, in his oratorical skills as an organiser, as an inspirational leader, as a courageous revolutionary willing to put himself in harm's way. You can understand some people concluding that revolution is therefore the product of great men. But Marxists don't believe that it's the case that great men are responsible for revolution. Is that right? Well, it's true to say that... Definitely, without Lenin's building of the Bolshevik Party over a long period of time and his political arming of the Bolshevik Party, then it's unlikely that the Russian Revolution would have been achieved at that time, that October 1917. And clearly Trotsky also played an extremely key role in the course of those events bringing about that revolution. But... As individuals, with even the greatest ideas in the world, which they had, they could not bring about those 
events, they could not bring about that revolution without that symbiotic relationship between them and the working class, well, between them and their party, the Bolshevik Party and the Bolshevik Party and the working class. And Trotsky develops that relationship in his pamphlet, The Class, the Party and the Leadership, which is another good pamphlet to read, another good piece to read. But it's necessary to have both. It's necessary to have leaders who can lead. And, you know, they're not born. Lenin and Trotsky only developed their skills to be able to carry out that role by years of experience and study and, you know, working, having the abilities that they had. You know, there's obviously personal talent involved, but, you know, people aren't born with that kind of knowledge and experience. But particularly, you know, they studied Marx, they studied Engels, they studied the Marxist history, and then they applied that. They took it, you know, a step further in the way that they managed to arm the movement in Russia at that time. So, really, it was a combination of... A whole number of different factors and certainly it's not just the genius of individuals being born into that role but it's the whole combination of historical circumstances and the way that individuals react in that situation and the way that they relate to the movement around them. Thanks very much Judy and as always if you like what you hear then recommend us to your co-workers and friends, donate to help fund us and if you agree Join the Socialists. Socialism is produced by the Socialist Party, the England and Wales section of the Committee for a Workers' International. Today we heard from Judy Beeson and I'm James Ivans. This episode was edited by Nick Hart. The CWI is holding an international online rally for the 80th anniversary of Trotsky's assassination, entitled Why Couldn't His Ideas Be Killed? It's on Sunday the 23rd of August from 2pm London time. You can register to attend at socialistworld.net. You can find further reading on this episode in the notes in your podcast app and at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash podcast. If you want to get in touch, email socialismpodcast at socialistparty.org.uk. Do you agree with the policies and actions the Socialist Party is fighting for? We need you. Send us your details at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash join. If you live outside England and Wales and want to join the fight for socialism in your country, contact the Committee for a Workers' International by visiting socialistworld.net. Socialism, the podcast, has no wealthy backers. We rely only on funding from the working class, which maintains our political independence. So help us take the fight to big business. You can make a regular donation or a one-off payment at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash donate. Till next time, solidarity.